Welcome to the Reformed Media Review. My name is Camden Busey. I'm here in Grays Lake, Illinois. I'm delighted to be back with you today. I have a good buddy. We have Lane Tipton with us. Lane is a pastor of Trinity OPC in Easton, Pennsylvania, and a professor, or a, I should say fellow of biblical and systematic theology here at Reformed Forum. Hey, Lane, how's it going? Hey, great, Cameron. Great to be here. Today, we're going to be speaking about Presbyterian history, and uh, as we like to do in Reformed Media Review, just offer a little bit of a synopsis and uh, information about a book so that you know more about it and uh, can follow up. You can decide from our conversation and our information here whether or not you want to look at it any further. So often we do new books and uh, brand new things that are coming out from publishers, but once in a while, I like to just talk about some books that maybe have, have uh, come uh, off the beaten path or books that are, are more classic or things that uh, maybe you never heard about. So my hope and desire with Reformed Media Review is that over time, we just you just treat us as kind of like maybe that friend you have at, and that, that uh, you know, at church you're having coffee and the guy's like, hey, check out this book. This book is pretty good. And you wouldn't have known about it otherwise. So we're that guy for you today, and I've got a book for you. I'll tell you that. Uh, today we're looking at this book, The Broadening Church, by a guy named, hear, hear this, Lefferts Letcher. Uh, this book is subtitled, A Study of Theological Issues in the Presbyterian Church Since 1869. Again, published or it's uh, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in Philadelphia, written by Lefferts A. Letcher. Lefferts is spelled L-E-F-F-E-R-T-S. Letcher is L-O-E-T-S-C-H-E-R. I'll put links, bibliographic links to this in the episode description. But um, in the inside cover of this is uh, inscribed uh, in Latin and then in English, in necessary things, unity, in doubtful things, liberty, in all things, charity. I... I couldn't put this book down. I absolutely loved reading this book. It's important that we get this in context. But Letcher, to my knowledge, was a professor of history at Princeton Seminary, if I'm not mistaken. This book is copyright 1954. That is extremely important that we understand the context of this book when it was written. My copy here is the, from the third printing in 1964. So I don't believe there were any editions. It's not, it doesn't say it's a third edition. I don't think anything was changed. So I'm, I think I'm looking at the original 1954 text, but uh, they had run out of copies and printed more. This book um, is a history of the Presbyterian Church, the mainline Presbyterian Church uh, in the North, uh, starting in 1869, going all the way up to 1937-ish, but then with a brief uh, reflection at the end of the book after 15 or 20 years beyond uh, the the the, uh, the split, or I should say really the, uh, from his view, the schismatics leaving the extreme conservatives. This book is valuable, not merely because it's a history. We have a lot of histories of the Presbyterian uh, modernist fundamentalist controversy. But Lane, I don't know if you've read any of this. I had not read any myself that of, of histories recounting the the, the Presbyterian Church, specifically the theological debates and controversies within it that are coming from a new school perspective. Yes, yes. And also coming from not a liberal perspective. We're not talking about Lef yes. Lefferts Letcher here being a, a modernist, but being a conservative of a kind himself, but a tolerant conservative. So he's one of, of the middle mediating figures writing history from that vantage point. To me, that was invaluable that I read this and understand. Have you ever uh, read anything of that sort? Um, besides outside of this, no, because in polarizing debates like you have between the modernists and fundamentalists, typically the people who are writing the histories or who are engaged in it are the people with great conviction, yeah. people who are fighting for the true religion on one side or the other. Uh, but, And I know you'll get into this, but I think the the fact that he is a moderate really gives you a window not only into those previous debates but it really has a lot of contemporary relevance I oh think, so. enormous and and i should say it's interesting you make this point that usually the people that are writing or that are advocating for something are the people that are 
they're not moderates, but they're they're the people that feel the strongest. So they're it's polarized. You have a majority of the literature written from people on the far left or the far right, whatever left and right means in in whatever particular debate. But what's interesting to me here, hearing a lecture write, is that I, I believe he is theologically conservative. He's actually um, you know committed to and and very sympathetic to people in history, uh, the history of the Presbyterian Church who are committed to the creeds and confessions written as they're written. He's not trying to do revisionism. He's not trying to do some sort of hyper historicized reading of the confession. I believe he's genuinely committed to those things. Yes. But I think in practice, figures like Letcher tend to be equally, I'll, I won't say more, but they tend to be equally committed to a certain broader, more tolerant view of the church. And and that's where I think, you. yes, you do have the, the moderates, the mediating conservatives in the middle. They're not as fired up theologically to advocate for or against a particular view. But the, what they do get out of bed for and what they do get animated about wanting to maintain is the peacefulness and ideally the unity of the church and the the expansion of the church in number, in significance, and in influence, the broadening of the church. But they want to do it without compromising. These guys, like Letcher, would like to do it without compromising the theological distinctives of the church. But if push comes to shove and you have some people advocating for the theological distinctives of the church and it's compromising the the scope and the tolerance of the church of the whole, then those people must be expelled. Yes. They're militant for moderation. Yes. Militant that's the one thing they're moderation. militant for. That's the thing they'll fight all day for. Yes. Which I you, think you've nailed it. Which you find so ironic is that the people advocating for tolerance at, at the end of the day on that point are the most intolerant of them all. That, that there is no room for a view that would want to 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 say, like Machen did with publishing Christianity and Liberalism, that within the Presbyterian Church there there are um, Christian Christians and liberals, Christianity and liberalism, and the two are different religions, and that liberals, people who hold to these views, cannot find a safe place or a home in this church. They ought to leave and be forced out. That is just anathema to a figure yes. like Letcher or the people that he might be representing. So I think this is a true, excellent work of history. I don't mean to say that he is trying to reread history. I don't mean to say that he is trying to revise it. But all history is written from a perspective. You could try to be as objective as you want, and that is a notable, uh, a, a noble thing to do. But at the same time, his presentation of the facts his ordering of the facts and his comment at times is disclosing a certain vantage point. And I found that to be utterly useful and indispensable to someone who is most sympathetic to Machen and, and others. You get a vantage point on Machen, you, you get an inside view of his critics and not just, you know, not the boogeymen. You know, a uh, 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 folk, you know, folks like Briggs in the 1880s and 90s, uh, uh, who really isn't the worst of the boogeymen. I mean, he was, the, but uh, you know, is compromising inerrancy. Or, you know, even in the 50s and 60s, you know, folks like Karl Barth who's not a member of the Presbyterian Church, but it's like, you know, we're we're not talking about full blown out there people developing cutting edge modernist theology. We're talking about folks who are in the middle who are personally maybe conservative, but nevertheless having a view of the extreme conservatives. And that's how time and time again, Letcher describes Machen and his his crew. They are the extreme conservatives, yeah. whereas I take it he would view himself as the, as the uh, balanced and reasoned conservatives, not the extreme, one, extreme ones. So let me go that, through. That, that's <laughs> fascinating, Candid. <laughs> Oh, let me go through some of the chapters here and, and explain some of the things I love the most and maybe I'll read a really brief section here at the end. Um, so uh, at the risk of being pedantic, uh, we have the, the uh, chapter titles here, The Wedding Day. So that's starting with uh, the, the reunion of Old and New School in the North, which happened in, if I'm not mistaken, 1869, but the first General Assembly after the reunion was 1870. 
So a great controversy. We had two great ones in the in the beginning of the Pres- American Presbyterian Church between old and new side, and then later between old and new school. But obviously a great split between North and South with the with the uh, Civil War, and that reunion didn't happen in the mainline until 1983. And I was a member of that church. I was born into the UPC USA. Uh, and then uh, in 83, when I was three years old, uh, the North uh, merged with the South. And that's what we have today with the PCUSA. So you got the wedding day, description of that. Shadows of coming events, then biblical criticism. We start to get into Briggs and uh, some other features there. Important things, uh, backgrounds to even the Pete Enns controversy. Uh, uh, you edited a book, I believe. Doesn't uh, Don't you have uh, Beals? Didn't Beale interact with Warfield and, and Briggs a little bit in the Gaffin Festschrift? Yes. Yeah, so there's some history there. It's important to read. Then we have a theological journal with Warfield was involved in, in a lot of the, uh, a lot of going on there. Same with Hodge. And uh, they had this joint journal with, uh, with <laughs> editors from all sides of the theological spectrum. Uh, chapter five is revision attempted. Chapter six is the Briggs case, then the Smith case than the aftermath of those cases. Chapter nine is the church's seminaries. And they focus a lot on Princeton because Princeton was maintaining rigid orthodoxy and really the voice, the leading old school seminary. But then you have Union Seminary and Lane Seminary. Lane, no, I hate to say it, but uh, your seminary, uh, I hope you weren't named after Lane didn't, Seminary. But those didn't fare <laughs> too well. And I was named after a football player, not train lane, but... <laughs> If it had been the seminary, that wouldn't have been very good. Well, Lane was in uh, in Cincinnati, but those were the two leading new school seminaries. A union uh, eventually got its independence, and there's there's a lot of interesting politicizing in that regard, how that happened. But my goodness, Union Seminary. Uh, look at where that has ended up these days. And uh, the McCormick Seminary in there as well, we should throw in there, which uh, was in Chicago. It still is. Um, there's an, some interesting uh, features and and uh, Letcher describes some of uh, those interactions there in their relation to old school and new school concerns. Uh, then we have a revision accomplished uh, in uh, chapter 10, which I think it was in 1903 where uh, the Westminster standards were revised ever so slightly. Most people saw them as maintaining their distinctive Calvinism. And so it was generally viewed as a, as a success or a win from the conservative side as opposed to totally revamping them as in a way that we might see in 1967, which is after this book was written. And then we have a, an emerging issue. Uh, and then chapter 12, a New York pulpit. You know what that one's about? Mm-hmm. Fosdick. Harry Emerson Fosdick, right, which uh, was became a lightning rod, a Baptist preacher who preached uh, in a in a Presbyterian church. So we have this odd union going on and this this broad evangelicalism where they're they're wanting really some form of like a pan-Protestantism. And uh, he preached a sermon entitled, Shall the Fundamentalist Win? And that was eventually, you know, they had a stenographer, but then a version of it was printed up and uh, that became a lightning rod for this modernist uh, fundamentalist controversy. Then there was a special commission of 1925, then a seminary reorganized. That's when uh, Princeton Seminary, the board was reorganized in a way to, um, basically in a way to get rid of the, what was viewed as a too conservative controlling board of directors. So they revamped it in order that a moderating position, not a liberal position, but the mediating middle would then have control. And J. Ross Stevenson, the president of seminary was given great power, more power than he had before, in order to try to bring the seminary more into alignment with the Presbyterian Church as a whole, rather than representing a splinter, you know, perspective of the Presbyterian Church. They were seeking to represent the church as a whole, basically make it less old school and more um, broaden it. That's the title of the book, The Broadening Church. And then finally, protesters withdraw in uh, chapter 15. Um, I couldn't get enough of this book. I just thought it was so well written. And uh, from a perspective that a voice that I hadn't read much of. And so it helped lend perspective and understanding to Machen and those, those early folks in the OPC and in Westminster Seminary in a way that I had not had before. Let me read to you um, 
the last two paragraphs of the final chapter. So there's a conclusion, but even before that, I think this summarizes it. And I also think it summarizes a bit of his historical shortcomings in the sense that I think he thought that history had vindicated his interpretation and vindicated the position of the mediating conservatives. But if you would have let the tape run past 1954, Machen in the long run would be, would be vindicated. Here's uh, page 154 and uh, the beginning of 155 of this book. Though the withdrawal movement from the Presbyterian church was inconsiderable numerically, so already right there you're seeing, you're toning down the split. Like there's just a few crazy people that left. It didn't impact us at all. You know, and there's always this constant complaint how this vocal minority, meaning Machen and others, were using the Presbyterian Guardian. They were very skilled on the radio and in the press to, to, to uh, basically to influence and basically it seemed like to, to trick uh, lay people simpletons into coming on board with their theological takes. So they were able to garner a great following because they were so skilled. With, and today they might say, well, they have this blog or this podcast and they, they, they get this reach and trick fool people into thinking that they're right, that they're the cause. It's, it's very interesting. That's so though, though the withdrawal movement from the Presbyterian Church was inconsiderable numerically, it did raise some legal questions about property rights. The General Assembly of 1936, anticipating such problems, appointed a special committee on legal procedure which later reported that in a number of cases, prompt action had made litigation unnecessary. Where litigation proved unavoidable, the church was overwhelmingly successful in its contention that in a connectional denomination, like the Presbyterian, with an integrated form of church government, local property rights in the last analysis are vested not in the local congregation, but in the denomination as a whole, and cannot be alienated from denominational control by congregational action. The termination of the judicial cases of 1936 marked the virtual cessation to date of theological controversy within the church's judicatories. In spite of important internal diversities, the church since 1936 has enjoyed the longest period of theological peace since the reunion of 1869. All, pro all problems fixed, Lane. Oh, they got yeah. rid of Machen and others, and the church has never been better. This is the greatest group of people we've ever had. GA is just fun. There are no more problems. All of our problems have disappeared with Utopia those troublemakers. Is secure. <laughs> 1954. That wow. was the view. The, the, uh, the mediating conservatives have won the day and uh, the Lord might as well come back right now. So it's it's post-millennialism at, at its, <laughs> at its yeah, peak. Yeah. It's, it's anti-doctrinal post-millennialism. Um, <laughs> that's, that's quite stunning. I may uh, be being a little overly critical or, or, or mocking tone. I, I thought this was an excellent work of scholarship. Oh, but yes, obviously, yes. I, uh, the, the history is presented with, with a view. And that's exactly why I think this is a valuable book. And I think, I think people should read this, not just people interested in Presbyterian history per se, but certainly OPC members, PCA members. I would love to read a similar type of book on the PCUS if one exists. So please write in if you know of, of one or a few uh, to read about the history of, of the main line in the South um, and, and their view of what would become the PCA uh, and, and their thoughts if there are similar comparisons. So please write in if you have anything of the sort. This book might be tough to find. I'm sure you can get it through interlibrary loan. I got a used copy and I found one that was affordable through ABE books, but only because they didn't list the author. So Ryan Noah found it for me just by searching on the title and it had been, it wasn't really added to ABE books very well by the bookseller. And I stumbled into an affordable copy because I think if it is listed properly, then the people looking for them will find them and it tends to drive the market price up. So you might have to get it through a library um, worse things could happen. But uh, I, I highly recommend the book. And uh, it, even those of you who know the history of the Presbyterian Church well, 
I think will your your understanding and your knowledge will be will be broadened, no pun intended, but it will be further developed, uh, fleshed out. You'll have a more robust what insert whatever adjective you want. But your understanding of the history, I'm not saying you'll necessarily come away with new conclusions about what had happened or new interpretation, but having um, the benefit of other voices is always a good thing. And you'll come to a more reasoned and, and thorough understanding of those important historical events. And ideally, learning the lessons of history help us into the future, hopefully not to repeat the same mistakes that, that have occurred in the past. So. Very good. You got any more thoughts on that or any reflection or questions, Lane? No, uh, not, nothing Nothing substantial. Yeah. I did have a joke or two that uh, <laughs> as you were reading the final two paragraphs about the triumphalist tone, but you, it is. you've more than sufficiently covered that one. But um, yeah, very helpful. And uh, I think I think that um, it would repay uh, to, to gain a historical vantage point on the controversies in the past because they shed immense light on the controversies that we're seeing right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're coming up on, you know, in a few years, the 100th anniversary of at least the reorganization of Princeton Seminary and the formation of Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. And um, it's good to know these things uh, because the history tends to repeat itself. It's cyclical in that way. So take a look at it. Uh, Leffert's Lecture, The Broadening Church. It's published by uh, UPenn. And uh, I don't know if it's still in print should be. Uh, I mean, if it isn't, somebody should bring it back into print. But uh, read it if you can. And uh, take a look at the other things we've got going on at reformedforum.org, other episodes of Reformed Media Review, and a lot of uh, book discussions coming in the very near future. Uh, But until next time, I want to say tola lege, take up and read.